tonight, the CCC lays off its workforce. The Prime Minister to present a budget which he admits was particularly difficult to craft amid COVID-19. And the NCOPT stands with its drivers who despite being given the go-ahead to operate across the zones, were not available for service. We have the details of these stories and more coming up. This is the Hot 7 Nightly News with Lovelies and Amy Zerger. Good night. It is Tuesday, the 28th of April, 2020. Welcome to the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. We're on floor, channel 117. The broadcast is also being simulcast on KISS FM and on our Caribbean Hot FM mobile app. I'm lovely St. Amy Joseph. Thank you for joining us. Hard hit by the economic fallout due to the current global COVID-19 pandemic, the Castries Constituency Council, CCC, has been forced to temporarily lay off its workforce. Memos to that effect have already been sent to staff through their shop stewards and trade unions. The temporary layoffs will be for a three-month period, effective the 1st of May 2020. Press and Communications Manager for the CCC, Jason Hollingseed, disclosed that the management of the city in terms of its upkeep and sanitation will not be compromised. He stated, and we quote, We do not have the option of borrowing. We can't continue to pay workers when we can't provide for them. It's a tough but necessary decision that we simply have to take. We know this will be distressing news for the workers during what is an already challenging time. It's not a decision that has been made lightly. We look forward to resuming as per normal once we come through this extraordinary situation. And quote that statement from the CCC. Prime Minister Alan Chastney has indicated that given the peculiar circumstances that the island is facing as a result of COVID-19, Crafting and delivering the 2021 budget, that should be 2020-2021 budget, was difficult. Prime Minister Alan Chastney indicated that budget estimations posed a difficulty given St. Lucia's current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. He says given the fluidity of the COVID-19 situation, the government is anticipating many changes. I've said that... Um... For the first time, what we're doing is living up to its name and that it's the estimates. Um, it was a very difficult budget to be able to put together. Um, we're still in the midst of the storm, so it's very difficult to predict um, what's actually going to happen. The PM stated that there are incredible feats that the government has achieved in its four-year tenure. However, the effects COVID-19 is having on the economy are going to interfere with the numbers the government has been putting forward, particularly in the debt to GDP. We were extremely proud of the fact that we've been able to bring the debt to GDP of St. Lucia down to 59%. What's the significance of that? That is a, an ambition that we've had um, to achieve by 2030. And here is it that we would have achieved it four years into government, um, which is a remarkable feat. But with what's taking place right now, that number is expected to balloon um, by somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. The Prime Minister indicated that some of the normal things being expected to happen right now are not exactly feasible. He says there is a lot to be done in order for the economy to revert to what it was pre-COVID. For instance, we have increased expenditures, we have reduced revenue, and the combination of that is created now an 8% deficit. So if you'll notice in our budget, we have estimated that tourism for the year will be down 50%. Um, and we have a significant, significantly reduced um, income level of, I think, about $950 million which is down from our original estimate of almost $300 million. Uh, and that is predicated on us getting back to where we were pre-COVID. Prime Minister Chastney says the government is very thankful to projects and initiatives that have already been initially funded as these will provide employment and the circulation of revenue in the economy during the difficult times facing the island. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Janine Thank you very much, Geneve. 
According to the vice president of the NCOPT, Michael Flood, minibus associations and drivers reserve the right to decide when they will commence consistent services. Flood says regardless of the clearance given by Transport Minister Guy Joseph, following consultations with the CMO, drivers of longer routes may still be operating at a loss and as such, must make the tough decision between maintaining their stability and meeting the needs of the public transportation sector. Shaka Wooding has more in this report. On April 27, 2020, Transport Minister Guy Joseph appeared on the Government Information Services COVID-19 Response Program to provide an update on the ease of public transport restrictions in the context of COVID-19. Two major developments were announced, whereby minibus operators can now carry up to nine passengers and operations between southern communities and the city centre were allowed to resume facilitating the movement of workers. However, reports coming from residents of Sufre claim that drivers from this area are yet to continue operations, instead suggesting that travellers take an alternate route through Viewfort and utilise this bus route to the city centre. Responding to criticisms on the position taken by Sufre minibus operators, Vice President of the National Council of Public Transportation, Michael Flood, says the wider public should consider why the drivers would refrain from the continuation of a daily paid service, given the detriment to their own pockets. Well, the, the minister cannot impose on any, any, any bus operator or, or association whether they should or, or, or must operate under those conditions. Of course, you, you must take into consideration the long journey from, from Soufre to Castries um, with nine persons on a bus. It is not economically viable for, for anybody to do. The person, those that are doing it now, need to be praised because I believe it is it is their way of giving back to St. Lucia. Um, the the Vfort guys, the 2H guys who have not uh, operated in, in weeks, they have chosen to, to, to commence operations and I, I, must, I must say that I'm, I'm very proud of them. Reasons being, having not operated for weeks and now having been asked to operate with only nine passengers from Vfort to Castries, that this is asking a lot of bus operators. Flood says in the case of Sufre, persons must consider the limited number of individuals who venture from this constituency for work. He underscored that this would further deter drivers from continuing services. We are in, 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 in a crisis, okay, and because there are restrictions, um, there are a number of, or most business places are still closed in Castries, and the people that are traveling are people who have to come to Castries to work and persons who have to go to Sufre to work. If it is not economically viable for them, okay, there are not many persons who leave Sufre to come to Castries to work. It will, not be, it will not be viable for them. So I, I do not think it is, it is because they want to decide on their own, look, we are not working. It is because the, the, the scope for business is not there. Flood believes that as the situation surrounding COVID-19 continues to stabilize, travelers will see the swift rectification of these issues. For At 7 News, I am Jaco Wooding. Governor General His Excellency Sir Emmanuel Neville Snack delivered a throne speech via video on Tuesday. The speech was delivered under the overarching theme of new challenges, new opportunities to continue to build a stronger St. Lucia together. Ahead of debate on the Prime Minister's $1.6 billion budget, the throne speech was delivered by Governor General His Excellency Sir Emmanuel Neville Snack on the theme new challenges, new opportunities to continue to build a stronger St. Lucia together. In the throne speech, the Governor General noted that in planning for the new fiscal year, the government determined that 2020 should be dubbed the Year of Health. At the time, there was nothing to portend COVID-19 and the dramatic, devastating impact it would have on society. The Governor General noted that significant resources have been allocated to respond to this new threat to global health. Victoria Hospital was redesigned and commissioned as a respiratory hospital, and several community clinics were established throughout the island to facilitate identification and treatment of infected persons. The transitioning from Victoria Hospital to the Owen King European Union OKEU Hospital was accelerated and this modern institution is now fully operational. 
The Governor General also noted that notwithstanding the current shutdown of the tourism industry as a consequence of the new coronavirus pandemic, St. Lucia's tourism sector had performed admirably over the past few years and says as the government looks to the future, it intends to implement the National Tourism Strategy and Action Plan, which charts a practical and sustainable course for the development of the tourism sector for the 2019-2023 period. Tourism initiatives will improve governance and provide a platform to spread the economic benefits of tourism to an increased number of local communities. It is our firm conviction that the institutional architecture for tourism must be transformed in order to maximize the sector's contribution to national development. To this end, the functions of the Tourism Authority have been streamlined and the role of the Ministry of Tourism redefined and limited to matters which include administration, policy formulation, licensing and certification. My government will, in the coming year, enact legislation to provide for state-owned company to administer village tourism in St. Lucia and to govern the St. Lucia Tourism Council. Another key highlight of the throne speech was promoting agriculture and food security. His Excellency noted that the priority focus areas set out in the Agricultural Policy Framework and Strategy 2016 to 2021 include the enhancement of national food and nutrition security, as well as agricultural diversification and the reduction of the food import bill. The value of these priorities has been thrown into sharp focus over the past months, with reductions in trade flows as countries close their borders to reduce COVID-19 transmission. The government intends to continue to emphasize these areas, together with the resuscitation of the banana industry and building resilience to climate change and disaster risk reduction. The areas for the government, as noted in the throne speech, include inclusive education, enhancing security and justice, modernizing the public sector, and ensuring equity. Traffic officers in the city are seeking resolution to what they say is an ongoing issue with some parliamentarians. By their account, a parliamentarian and minister openly refuses to adhere to parking restrictions within the city centre and has, on several occasions, blatantly ignored the authority of traffic officers who attempt to correct or direct him to designated parking zones when accessing the House of Assembly. Information reaching us has claimed that this vehicle, allegedly belonging to a government minister, has been left here parked illegally on the sidewalk, although police officers have attempted to intervene in the matter. It is said that two officers have approached the owner of this vehicle to ask that it be removed, but to no avail. This incident truly leaves the question, are government ministers believed to be above the law by themselves or by any other parties? Many cannot help but to question what would have unfolded if it were a regular citizen who committed this act. For Hot 7 News, I am Jack Oding. You're watching the Hot 7 TV nightly news. Still to come, members of the public speak on their budget expectations. The opposition calls on the government to get its priorities right. And MPs and senators debate the merit of the airport project at this time. That and more coming up after the break.